All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I would just like to welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining our session today. Uh, we are delighted uh, at this conference to support it. Uh, we are so thankful for Western Governors University uh, graciously allowing us at Juvo Ventures uh, to use this room and this opportunity to feature a conversation around work-based learning and how technology is revolutionizing some of the potential outcomes as we connect learners, academics, and employers. We'd like to start first with uh, some brief introductions from our panelists. Uh, we'll start here uh, with Courtney to introduce herself and we'll work our way uh, down uh, to the end with Ryan. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Courtney Hills Macbeth. I'm the Provost and Chief Academic Officer at Western Governors University. I've been on the job 100 days now, so I know everything and you can ask me anything. <laughs> and just so we make sure we're all awake today, um, of my professional and personal goals, one of them is to eventually have a hairstyle and a bun that matches Dana. So I'm just gonna put it out there to make it interesting today that one day I hope to have a man bun that looks like yours. <laughs> you could pull it off. Um, Katie Fang, oh, can you hear me? Um, I'm the founder and CEO of School Links. We are a college and career readiness platform uh, for K-12 institutions. So um, I have been doing this literally feels like forever, um, but this is my first job out of college. Um, nine years in the running and um, 38 states and serving about 5 million users across the country. Hi, uh, my name is Dana Stevenson. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Ripen. Ripen uh, is a work integrated learning platform that connects students to companies through short-term skill specific projects. Uh, we do that primarily by partnering with higher education institutions and empowering faculty members to embed employer design projects into the curriculum. So students can take what they're learning, apply it in a real world setting and solve business challenges uh, with real companies, engaging with real companies uh, in their community and around the world. We also complement that model with uh, paid project-based internships. Uh, and then more lately, we've been doing a lot of reskilling and upskilling programs. So up augmenting upskilling programs with project-based experiences uh, where the training is focused on the skills gap, but there's also left behind a, an experience gap. So if we can solve this experience gap, we can make sure that we get the best possible employment outcomes for the participants. Ah, the experience gap, favorite topic. I'm Ryan Craig, and I'm Managing Director at Achieve Partners. We're an investment firm focused at the intersection of education and employment. I'm a co-founder of Apprenticeships for America, but most important, I'm a board member of Ripen. So my, my job here is to echo and amplify everything Dana says. <laughs> Fabulous, I appreciate that. And we're just so fortunate to have them here today and to learn from them. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end and I did want to welcome all those on LinkedIn Live that are joining us. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. Uh, just a, a little bit of background in regards to uh, Juvo Ventures. So Juvo Ventures was uh, started in 2019 and it is an early stage venture capital firm. Um, we have on our general partnership, uh, President Scott Pulsifer and Nadim Said, uh, who's also the CFO of WGU. And uh, we have a number of LP investors of like-minded universities, as well as private investors. We are grateful for our fund one. We uh, have 23 investments, and thankfully we've been able to uh, support increasing access and affordability to learners worldwide. We have investments in Mumbai, Abu Dhabi, Canada, um, also in Singapore and Switzerland, uh, as well as uh, some of our US focus. But we really are building upon the 25 years history of WGU. It's in our DNA. And even though we're a for-profit, we definitely believe in the inherent worth and potential of every learner. And we believe in creating pathways to meaningful opportunity with social and economic mobility. Okay. We'll go next slide. So to set the stage for our conversation, I wanted to point out a couple interesting findings from ECMC and Vice that 79% of high school students say it is important to have on-the-job learning experiences during their post-secondary education. Also, only 50% of high school students say that they have access to career exploration programs or resources. And we're very fortunate with Katie to have 
some great insights into almost 5 million learners that are on their platform to give us some understanding of uh, the learnings and outcomes. Uh, next slide. We, uh, through the Cengage uh, report that was uh, recently published in July, uh, surveying over 1,000 grads and 1,000 employers, we found that 58% of recent grads believe employers should be more closely uh, aligned with learning programs to diver develop outcomes and skills needed to perform a job, okay? Second, 35% or more than a third of those grads who reported doing some work-based learning had to find the work themselves. And that has been a staggering challenge, right? It's like these students are out and they're trying to uh, get through their own academic uh, journey and trying to uh, allocate and find their own internships. You know, they're trying to find their apprenticeships. Um, they're going to career fairs. The, the awareness and the, the job shadowing uh, is a challenge. So we are grateful to have Courtney and Dana to talk to us a little bit today about what they're doing with their organizations at Ripen and also WGU. Okay, next slide. Couple things to point out here. 52% of graduates with a bachelor's degree are underemployed one year after uh, completing. That is a, a staggering response for those unsatisfied or feeling underemployed after getting their credential and their degree. Number two, the odds of becoming underemployed after completing the bachelor's degree are 49% lower when you actually are able to participate in an internship or a work-based uh, learning opportunity. So, you know, we are seeing um, the measure, being able to measure these outcomes has been a challenge in the past. You know, obviously with the school boards and uh, school districts, you know, the reporting, you know, around the Perkins Act, the uh, ESSA, um, school districts are, are trying to grapple with this, universities are trying to find it, but it's been a challenge. Uh, we, are, we are seeing uh, everyone is, is jumping in to try to find the solutions here. Okay, next slide. 81% of these students said that it's important or very important for educational institutions to incorporate company-led projects to mimic real-world projects, and this is from Wiley. But here's the, the kicker here. Only 30% of these institutions currently offer such projects, okay? So the question is why, and the question is how can we change that, and what is the role that technology plays in expanding the work-based learning opportunities. So, first question to our panelists for everyone, okay? It seems to me that you all resonate with the imperative for a better prepared workforce. Could you please share uh, with, with our guests insights that you've gleaned from your experience working with both learners and employers? And we'll start with Courtney. Thanks, Sean, for starting us off with an evidence base, which is always a great way to start. Um, I would maybe just touch on, for me, the reason why I came, one of the reasons why I joined WGU recently is having spent um, most of my career developing and managing internship programs and or researching work-based learning. And the, the crux of the problem is scale and how to do it at scale. And so I'm excited to be at WGU and really plant a flag on us leading out in terms of experiential learning at scale through different types of models. Uh, when it comes down to implementing work-based learning, I think a lot of times we talk about the data or it's nice to have and social capital. And, but at the end of the day, there's a chicken and egg problem of having to ensure that you have a set of employers and you develop those employers across for-profit, non-profit. And, um, and there used to be the constraint of geographic location. Now, Ripen and others have helped solve that problem in the pandemic to be able to think about virtual internships, but on one hand, you have the need to manage employer relationships, and most traditional higher ed has invested in athletics and alumni engagement and advancement offices rather than investing in employer engagement. So there's sort of this historical um, legacy of other parts of institutions being built up to serve certain needs, and the employer has not been one of them. And then on the other side of the equation, you have to have enough students and qualified students and the structure by which to offer the internship. So structuring that equation of essentially a 
part-time staffing agency is, is quite difficult to do. So some of these are the structural um, barriers that are at place of our um, attempt to sort of offer work-based learning at scale. So I'll stop there. Um, and for us, our primary population that we serve is K-12 students. And um, it is even more amplified um, at the K-12 level. I feel like the key issue that we're trying to address is information asymmetry. Um, when you think about career guidance and career navigation, primarily that is a job of a career counselor. And if you know, in the K-12 world, counselor to student ratio is about one to 500, right? How can a counselor at a high school level um, really help personalize that entire experience for every single student in their caseload? That's a tall order, coupled with um, academic support and um, testing and social emotional issues. It's impossible for a counselor to provide that type of attention to every single student. And um, we see that issue uh, being recognized, but the support is still not there. Because when you think about it, as a counselor, uh, most of the professional counselors on our platform that I've encountered in my professional career, they tend to um, have a master degree and they spend their entire lives in the classroom, right? They studied and then they progressed um, um, through university, getting that bachelor's degree, master's degree, then they go into education. Um, they haven't really experienced a real world of hundreds of careers out there to be able to relay that information um, with very tactical feedback. So um, the role for us that we think um, that we play um, in this space is that truly being that broker um, and helping employers being able to spend very limited amount of time that they have efficiently to disseminate the information from the organization, right? Helping students understand what it takes to work in a certain industry. And I think that brokerage is extremely important because students need to be able to hear from the real world and um, not rely on the limited support that they can get um, from classroom. Awesome. I think it's no surprise, based to anyone here, really, with the, based on the, the rising cost of living, the rising cost of higher education, the diminishing shelf life of, of, of rapidly evolving skills. It's no surprise that learners want to enroll in an academic program that's going to better prepare them for the workforce and lead them to a, a, a good job. Um, those eye-watering stats that you, you just shared, 80%, uh, it's no, probably no surprise to anyone, that 80% of high school students want an on-the-job learning experience as part of their post-secondary education. Uh, I'm sure for parents it's at 80% or higher. Um, but this other uh, component that you were, you were sharing here around uh, underemployment, over one half of college grads are underemployed. Um, what we know now, thanks to the research from Strata and Burning Glass, if you start your careers underemployed, you're more likely to stay underemployed. 45% are still underemployed 10 years later. What that's telling us is that underemployment is really sticky. It's that if you, st if you start your career in the wrong role, uh, uh, you, you, it's, really hard to difficult to, it's really difficult to break that cycle. So we can, what, we, what that tells us is that you can no longer rely on a, on a student's first job after graduation to be the launch pad where they launch their career. They've got to get experience earlier on and throughout their entire education pathway, solving the experience gap, so, so that they, they, they have the skills, they have the professional connections, they have the experience, they can land meaningful employment. What we're also hearing on the employer side is that employers, especially small, medium businesses, and we need the small, medium businesses to participate, they are employers too, they don't have the luxury, they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the capacity to uh, have these really intensive training programs where they can take individuals on with no experience. Um, they will self-select themselves out. That's why you see so many, I know you talk about this a lot, Ryan, you see so many uh, entry-level jobs with requiring you know, three years of, of experience minimum. Uh, and then, of course, they'll just go on and they just rather poach that from another company, which causes a, you know, a whole other 
uh, a problem. But what gives us a lot of hope uh, and what we're seeing all over our platform, I didn't mention this earlier, we have over 35,000 employers in our platform. We delivered over 220,000 experiences through this model since 2017. What gives us hope is that these employers actually want to be part of the solution. They want to collaborate. They want to engage with the right setup, with the right infrastructure. They want to be part of the solution, helping prepare students with the right experience to help them grow, to help them create new jobs, to help them fill those jobs where the talent is needed most. Yeah, I think we're approaching the point where the only people who are going to be, uh, who won't be underemployed are people who are prepared to write those reports that you were citing <laughs> at the outset, because there's going to be an unending demand for those kinds of reports. Um, the, um, you know, and I was struck by, in, in the slides, just, you know, all of these uh, uh, students saying employers, you know, they, 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 they wish employers were, would be more engaged and so forth. Like, what's wrong with employers? What's their problem? Well, I'll tell you what their problem is, is that, and in my, in my recent book, I actually began referring to them as employers, and then I stopped myself, and I said, well, wait a second. They don't think of themselves as employers. They're companies, <laughs> and they're companies that are in business to deliver a product or service to clients, and if they could do that with no employees, they would do that. <laughs> so I, I think that, um, you know, to Dana's point, um, you know, you have to make it so easy it's like turnkey to employers to do this. And that's what's necessary is to build this infrastructure that other countries are actually ahead of us on, this work integrated learning, work-based learning infrastructure uh, that we just, we just don't have. And these are you know, intermediaries like Ripen and School Links and WGU that will stand between the learner seeking relevant work experience and the employer desiring a prepared worker to have with demonstrated skills in work experiences and saying, we're gonna do it for you. We'll make it easy for you. And that's, that's exactly what, 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 what they do. Uh, and we need th thousands of intermediate, we need ripens, the ripens of the world to be a thousand times bigger than they are today, or we're gonna have a real problem because AI is coming, AI is here, and AI is gonna turn the experience gap into a chasm because the, uh, the entry level jobs that we all did, the good first jobs that we got, the bargain was uh, we're going to, I'm gonna hire you and you're gonna learn the ropes and as you learn the ropes, you're gonna do a bunch of scut work. So that bargain is gone now because the scut work employers are gonna expect that to be done by AI. They're going to want you, the entry-level worker, to be using that AI and, and spending uh, in the vast majority of your time doing higher-value product work, client work, what name, what what have you. But you're not going to be able to do that work without experience. And so the the you know the data that we see where these job descriptions that for jobs that used to be entry-level jobs are asking for six, twelve months of experience. It's going to become two, three, four years of experience that they're going to ask for. And so we desperately need this infrastructure, these intermediaries to stand in the middle, provide these work-based learning experiences, and then provide these pathways to employment. Very good, thank you so much. Dana, this question is for you. Given the significant value of paid internships and co-op opportunities, as demonstrated by research, why is access to these opportunities limited for many students? and what innovative solutions are being developed to overcome these barriers? Well, first of all, I think when, when most people think about workspace learning, I think what mostly comes to mind for many folks um, is in-person, uh, internships, apprenticeships, co-op opportunities. Um, and you know, there's no shortage of research, as you show, showed us earlier to just now, uh, that demonstrates the positive outcomes that these experiences have. The challenge that I think Ryan is getting at, that we're, we're getting at here, is that there, we have a supply and demand problem. Um, there simply aren't enough companies who are engaging in this. There's no shortage of demand on the, on the student side. I think that's all very, very clear. In fact, if students could, they'd probably take three, four, five. In fact, we have lots of students on our platform who do get to take three, four, five, um, and, and would take more if, 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 if they could. Um, but the, that, the, the, those, that supply and demand problem is actually exacerbated when we, t when we think about uh, students from equity deserving groups. Many students face barriers. Uh, maybe that's a geographical barrier uh, where they don't have the experiences in their own backyard. Uh, they're in a smaller rural community. Uh, that could be lack of social capital or professional connections. That could be hiring biases in the recruiting process. Um, there are an enormous amount of barriers that, that exacerbate this problem for individuals who come from equity deserving groups. And so, we believe that talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. And so 
the new innovations in this space that allow uh, unique uh, types of experiences. I think our, our, our higher ed partners that we think are the, see are the most forward thinking uh, are, are, are seeing these types of work-based learning experiences on a continuum. There are shorter, uh, shorter duration, lower intensity experiences uh, with maybe a little bit less autonomy, uh, a little bit you know, fewer uh, teachable error moments. I mean, still an opportunity to make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, collect feedback from a real employer. That's the real world. Uh, all the way up to higher intensity engagement. So you can have a, you know, a, maybe a 10-hour project and the project-based model that we do in a classroom where students are putting 10 hours of effort into it, coming up with a challenge, getting exposure and career clarity. Uh, scaffolding that with multiple project-based experiences uh, all the way up to a, to a capstone project where it's 240 hours and you have a group working with one company solving, solving real business challenges, lots of teachable errors, lots of opportunities to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes, which is so important. Uh, developing communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, problem solving, and all those goals that employers think are, are, are just so, so, so valuable. So I think what we're, we're starting to see is just more higher education institutions understanding that if we need to meet the unique needs of more of our learners, uh, we're looking at more flexible approaches to learning. We need more flexible approaches to work-based learning. I just add, I think, you know, I think for, from what Dan, Dan just said, there's no one size fits all, right? They can be long, short, they can be paid, they can be unpaid, but they do have one thing in common, which is they're not requiring the employer to jump through 10 hoops in order to do this. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we need employer buy-in. I know uh, 35,000 employers on the ripe end that's pretty significant, uh, and I'll stop referring to them as employers as, as well. They're companies, right? Um, but you're right. Courtney, you've spent a good portion of your career building and scaling internship programs. Now that you're at WGU, the largest nonprofit university in the country, with scale being one of the biggest hurdles with work-based learning, how are you thinking about it at WGU? Well, much of the same way that Dana just talked about in terms of a spectrum of opportunities, right? So. One of the secret sauces of WGU is we started out with teaching and nursing, which has an inherent, given the domain, built-in clinical experience. So uh, we've been doing clinical experiences at scale uh, for quite some time now. So there's an added dimension to we now have more first-time going college students and younger students. So these bring in different personas, different student needs. So. Um, we're, you're, we're on an adventure here to think about what that spectrum looks like in terms of with our proven pathways in health and education, how do we leverage the moment of the apprenticeship model and how to really leverage that. So we are on the forefront on that running fast uh, to be a leader in that space. And then thinking about these additional models of what does project-based learning look like that's embedded within coursework um, what are job embedded um, degrees and what they look like? I think for me, um, from a from a sort of theoretical standpoint, what's interesting is thinking about work-based learning historically has been based on a time-based model, right? If you do 10 hours a week over 12 weeks and you get three credit hours. Well, competency-based education is not based on time. It's based on demonstrating skill and competency. So how do we overlay work-based learning that has time-based constraints to it to a competency-based model? And so our team is, is really thinking hard about this and what are the different types of models that we can deploy depending on the domain and the field and what the industry demands while at the same time having younger learners come um, to WGU and opening up more programs that are sort of broad-based like business administration and psychology, et cetera, areas where the internship becomes even that much more important when you have these more broad degrees that don't have the direct clear pathway to a job. That's where internships, work-based learning become even more important to ensure you get, a well, A, a paid internship ideally, um, but then that can lead to that first good job and determine your earning trajectory over a lifetime. So one thing, Ryan, I was just thinking about, you know, thinking a lot about the achievement gap and what AI is going to do, putting pressure on the level of that, what is that first job. There's another pressure from the bottom up on this achievement gap that we're seeing, which is with younger learners coming to us, going through the pandemic and that skills gap that's happening with 
younger learners hitting college and not being prepared for college level. So I feel like there's a squeeze from both ends uh, that because of the evidence base we know comes with work-based learning experiential that, just, that heightens the importance of it. So um, I think it's important for us to remember the pressure is coming from two and maybe multi-dimensions. Um, for it, It's an imperative for us to think about as education providers, and especially at WGU, given the students that we serve and our um, constant uh, focus on how do we close equity gaps in completion. That's great. Thank you so much. And to Ryan, I think this actually makes sense to, to give you this question and this timing. You've been a strong advocate for innovative pathways to employment, particularly through earn and learn alternatives to, to traditional higher education. How do you see employer and government's role in addressing this need currently? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a uh, it, it, it's everything. I mean, we're uh, I just I, I had a book come out six months ago called Apprentice Nation. Um, we talk about work integrated learning. We talk about uh, uh, internships, but apprenticeship is the gold standard because uh, it's a full time job where you're being paid and, and it's um, you can support yourself. So you don't have to be able to uh, pay tuition or uh, be willing to take on debt in order to progress down that uh, down down that down that pathway. Uh, we are at a material disadvantage relative to other countries just because we haven't invested in that infrastructure. Uh, we are the leader in tuition-based or debt-based career launch infrastructure. We are last among developed countries on earn and learn infrastructure, and we need to catch up. We need to catch up in large part because AI is going to make it much more important to be able to to have that. But, you know, in a nutshell, uh, we don't we don't fund enough. We you know, we spend over a thousand times more uh, on tuition based career launch infrastructure than we do on earn and learn uh, career launch infrastructure. Uh, we and then we're spending the money. We've been spending the money the wrong way. Uh, we've been trying to issue grants, uh, award grants, which these grants are going to uh, organizations that are good at applying for Department of Labor grants, not uh, organizations that are good at uh, creating apprenticeship uh, uh, programs and apprentice jobs. So there's a lot, a lot to do. But the good news is that there's been progress even in the last few months uh, on all, all this. And I'm happy to discuss with anyone who's interested or who didn't come to the 11 o'clock panel on apprenticeships. Shame on you if you didn't. <laughs> Please take a minute, actually. We would love to hear more about that. Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, so the good news is that uh, we had on the 11 o'clock panel Adele Burns from uh, California's Division of Apprenticeship Standards. And uh, two years ago, she launched the first formula-based funding for uh, apprenticeships in the country, which is what every other country does, which is to say, uh, you hire an apprentice, uh, you get pay, you get, you get funding from the government, which is how we fund post-secondary education, right? The money flows with the student. That's not how it's worked in apprenticeship until, until now. So California led the way, and then the good news is in the minibus that passed uh, Congress a month ago, Congress is directing the Department of Labor in, for the 2025 year to begin shifting from uh, the grants that they've been uh, uh, trying to award uh, to, uh, to formula-based uh, funding for apprenticeships. And I believe that once we actually begin uh, rewarding uh, sponsors and intermediaries and employers for actually creating apprentice jobs, we're going to see uh, dramatic momentum around uh, apprenticeships. Um, the, 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 the sort of dirty little secret is, uh, you know, every other country funds apprenticeship uh, uh, differently from how they fund workforce development and workforce training programs. Uh, we have been putting it in the same bucket, uh, but it's, it's not workforce training or development. These are jobs. Um, so that's what, what's what makes apprenticeships uh, different from other forms of, of training. Ryan, do we know the market size of that funding potentially in 2025? You know, I mean, the, the federal government spends uh, 300 million a year approximately on uh, apprenticeship uh, apprenticeship programs so um, but it's you know it's we, we need to if if we were spending at the level of the UK we would be spending uh, probably a hundred times more 30 billion yeah and that would then you know um, put us all, all on on the road to governor Newsom's goal is 500,000 apprentices in California which would put the country on path for something like four million apprentices which would mean that we have as many apprentice jobs as we have places in freshman classes across the country, which is sort of the, the, the vision, right? We should, have, we should have options. So high school graduates should be able to uh, ha have as many earn and learn options as they do 
tuition-based uh, options for career launch. And if they want a uh, tuition-based option, they will expect that uh, those programs will have built-in multiple work-integrated learning uh, and internship uh, experiences. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you, Ryan. This next question is for Katie. How do you see technology playing a role in work-based learning programs based off of the conversations that we've had to this point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to address, um, pick up where you left off around college readiness. I think um, we are taking a different perspective and going even more upstream um, in the population and trying to serve them at the you know K through 12 transitional uh, point in time and, and trying to figure out, are you ready and are you not ready? And I think probably the word college and career readiness is pretty familiar to the people in the crowd. Um, and there is a little bit of uh, chicken and egg. Do you prepare them for college or do you prepare them for career, right? In the K, K through 12 world, I think there is an um, um, increased emphasis on career readiness more than college readiness these days. And just judging from the population, millions of students we serve on our platform, we're seeing the trend where people are placing an emphasis because college may not be the end all be all, Everybody in the end will have a career, right? Whether that's through college, four-year, two-year military, different routes to get there. But the backward planning is super important to understand where you want to lend as a goal, career, and backward plan your education pathway. So for us, um, it's really interesting creating the platform and looking at the different approaches we can take. First of all, when you're tackling the college readiness side of the problem, um, you know, that process is very complicated, right? And that's partially the reason why I started a company and using, you know, legacy platforms and all of that. But when you think about it, it's actually pretty standardized. You have a common application, right, that nonprofit organization to allow one application to apply for all, most of the universities out there. And you have a specific timeline that you have to follow. You have FAFSA applications and all of that. It's a pretty standardized, complex but structured. But when you look at the career readiness side, um, I think we are just scratching the surface in the K-12 space where most companies are trying to solve, uh, platforms are trying to solve this problem. We're still at the exploration stage where we're giving informational content to our users, right? To our students, to our counselors and families trying to educate where I think the opportunity lies is really the work-based learning side in the K-12 setting because without really getting those hands-on experience, students won't be able to know what they like and what they don't like, right? Or what they might be a fit for in the future. And it's also very hard. And, and in our setting, work-based learning isn't just about defining the um, ultimate goal career but it's also to define a college pathway, the major that you want to select, right? And I think through those experiential um, learning, um, students can really accelerate and avoid making very, very expensive mistakes. I just good. add that, you know, it, it starts with the state uh, CCR standards. Every state has career and college, uh, college, college <laughs> they said career and college, it's actually college and career readiness standards because uh, these standards really have nothing to do with career. Uh, they're very generic. They read like a description of what we think an educated person should have. And, um, you know, it, 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 they're, they're fairly generic. Uh, so, um, you know, you, we, we kind of get what we, uh, what, we, what we deserve in some sense. We, we need to be much more prescriptive. And obviously, uh, you know, the decline in career and technical education at uh, the high school level is a direct result of, uh, of, of, of that and the fact that, you know, we don't have anywhere to send students who aren't on a college path. Right, exactly. And to, to that point, uh, Dana, with being prescriptive on how you approach employers, like when you're um, trying to onboard and convince a company, right, of the reasons why they'd want to work on your platform, how do you do that? Well, it, it, there, there are 
two types of employers, I think. There are, well, there, there's everything in between, but um, two ends of the spectrum would be employers who are looking, doing this for, ta for, for talent purposes. So they're a larger organization. Typically, they're growing. They want to use project-based experiences to be the first new step in the recruitment process. So it's part of the assessment. It's part of the way to build their employer brand, diversify their talent pipeline. On the other side of the spectrum, we have these smaller businesses, these smaller businesses that are under 50, under 20 employees, uh, and they're looking to, to get help. They are uh, uh, increasingly trying to innovate, trying to uh, build the business case for new uh, innovations that they're investing in, into their, in, in their business. Perhaps they're uh, wanting to work with students who are studying data analytics. They want to get help with data analytics for new data visualization. They want to build the business case on that so they can invest more in that. What's really exciting about those businesses is that we can actually convert them from a business who first is coming there to get the project done, that's what they're coming for, but then realize that talent is everywhere and that these individuals can then actually come and join their organization. Uh, I'll just mention really quickly, our largest scale project is 25,000 students who have gone through it. 70% of them report uh, uh, self-identify as being from equity-deserving groups, so it's really breaking down barriers for individuals who wouldn't have otherwise had access. It's a it's an 80-hour project. The students get paid $1,400 for completing it with, with an employer. Um, but more importantly, 74% of students who, who complete that project get one or more job offers after completing the project, and 46% of those job offers come from the company who did the, they did the project with. Many of those businesses first came, or companies first came, uh, because they were looking for help with a project and realized that there's a fantastic, fantastic talent here they don't want to lose. Fabulous. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, just the, you know, also research has demonstrated that the best predictor of uh, performance in a job is not education or uh, background or interviews, but rather uh, a demonstration of, of uh, you know, in a trial uh, effectively, which is what this is. That's fabulous. We'd like to open uh, the last couple minutes here to uh, q and A. I've got a question back there. There you go. Here comes some microphones. Yeah, this is a question for Courtney. Um, for the colleges, one of the big uh, impediments to me is that we spend so much time with the liberal arts, and the kids are not getting, kids and college kids are not finding time to do a lot of these extensive internships in, in high school states that, uh, or states that don't have too many requirements. Right, I think you bring up a really important point, which is we need it, we need work-based learning and internships required and especially in those majors where there's not that direct career path. And the combination of that practical experience in the workplace with skills, higher order skills that are taught in um, those in types of program of critical thinking, you know, communication, et cetera, the combination of that is powerful. So I always, it's sort of easy to go to a sort of bifurcated, like is it this or that, but it's a both and. And so it's how do we combine the two but it's got to be embedded in the core because all of our kids are, you know, will have access and can do internships. The key question is how do we build the systems and the policies and practices to ensure the students who can benefit the most have access to it? And what that means is it needs to be required and it needs to be embedded in the curriculum so that everyone participates. Thank you. Next question in the back. Yeah, my name is Reena Gupta, and I'm the founder for a foundation called Mom Relaunch. And we have uh, literally, for the past five years, been focused on creating a program on giving the experience and the confidence and the community to moms to nurture and get that back into the workforce. Um, we have done it all single-handedly without any grants and donations and all. But now we are at a point, and we focused only on one tech industry, salesforce.com, where we just honed each and every part of the whole process. We call it as a seedling to mother tree journey of uh, the whole process. Now, my question is, how do we scale our program now through programs like uh, grants and donations and from the government like and we are based in California by the way so love to figure out uh, what suggestions you have now everything that you guys have been talking about we have like literally baked into our program and just to let you know my work my experience has been in workforce industry for over 20 years I can take a little bit of a stab at that. We, we have been really successful uh, in working with organizations like yourselves, actually, in, in uh, building programming uh, and in going and se securing, uh, whether it's government or, or foundation philanthropic dollars funding uh, to catalyze scale. Now, uh, I think that's key on the, on, the, on, the, on the foundation side is that really the, the, those philanthropic dollars really want to be seen as a catalyst. Um, and so you need to be 
you know, I think a big part of what we bring to the table is the ability to actually create scale in a very cost-effective and efficient way. Um, I really hope that, that, that it sounds like there's some really high-quality, high-impact experiences happening with that, with that program. And uh, if you can put a third-party research study, uh, an evaluation around that, and really demonstrate, demonstrate the impact, then, then I think dollars will really, really follow. Absolutely, of course, 100%, <laughs> let's <right>. do it. <laughs> okay, we are at the end of our time, but please join me with expressing our gratitude to these panelists, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>